I think one of the biggest aha moments I experienced is learning that leadership is actually sort of a, a, a you build toward it, and, and it starts with a few foundational principles. And the very first principle to, to reach leadership is getting results. So results lead to credibility, credibility leads to respect, respect leads to influence, and influence leads to leadership. There's a magazine that we had in the United States called Discover Magazine, and I, I really absorbed that a lot as a kid. And the wonderful thing about Discover Magazine is it, it covers such a broad spectrum. It covers technology, it covers medicine and chemistry and astronomy and environmental. It covers so many different things, and it talks about this. Artificial intelligence is all the rage right now. I think it's impressive that, you know, there, how much of that is being pursued. I think it's kind of grassroots. Lounge. The next is where ideas meet innovation. We are thrilled to have you here with us today. Your incredible experience in technology and leadership are truly inspires us. We look forward to learning from your expertise and insights. Let the conversation begin. Brad, here comes the first question for you. Do you recall any aha moment that triggered you or inspired your leadership journey? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a I think one of the biggest aha moments I experienced is learning that leadership is actually sort of a, a, a you build toward it and, and it starts with a few foundational principles. And the very first principle to, to reach leadership is getting results, getting results for your team, getting results for your coworkers, getting results for your employer. And the moment you start out right off the bat, getting those results, you start to build up your credibility. As your credibility rises, then people start to respect you more. And as your respect grows, you have influence. People will start coming to you and asking for your opinion on things. They will ask you for your input on, on product that they're building. And when you have that, enough people are, are, are accepting of your influence, that's leadership. So that was a big aha moment for me. I was doing that instinctively. I didn't really realize I was doing that. But once someone laid that out in terms of a foundational building block, it made a lot of sense. So results lead to credibility, credibility lead to respect, respect leads to influence, and influence leads to leadership. Brad, challenges are something everyone encounters at some point in their life. So in facing the challenges of the tech industry, could you share an important moment that you believe was important in setting the course for your career? I think setting the course of my career, I think one of the biggest pieces was when I made a transition out of serving in the United States military and moving into corporate America and, and moving into a technology space, I, I immediately realized that I was surrounded by a lot of smart people and I needed to refresh my education, refresh my competencies. So literally within that very first year of leaving the military and joining a high tech company, I went and applied for getting a master's degree and I pursued a master's degree in engineering. So I have a master's from University of Texas at Austin in engineering. And that was a huge element of my development, of, of really raising myself up in terms of my competency and being able to really uh, operate well with my colleagues who were very technically gifted and had really, I, I spent seven years in the military and they'd spent seven years in tech. So how do I catch up to them with that seven years of Delta? And I did that really through education and then just determination of immersing myself in the technology and trying to understand more deeply what it was that they had built up over seven years that I was little learning again new. So education is a great vehicle for anybody who's trying to break into a different career field. Um, it, it worked for me. It was amazing. This sounds completely interesting, Brad. It's almost like juggling between two different careers and now here a big achievement so brad growing up what figures part your fascination for technology for me there's a magazine that we had in the united states called discover magazine and i i really absorbed that a lot as a kid and the wonderful thing about discover magazine is it it covers such a broad spectrum it covers technology it covers medicine and chemistry and astronomy and environmental it covers so many different things and it talks about the discoveries that are going on in those different areas. And as a kid, that was fascinating, like how much creativity we were we were 
applying to these different things, neuroscience, you know, the, the, the artificial intelligence that at the time was obviously not existent, but now it's a big thing. And so as a kid, I really absorbed that magazine and it made me fascinated with technology and advancement. And it's, to me, you see it everywhere we go. There's technology in medicine, there's technology in the environment, there's technology in, in just work that we do. There's technology in the tool sets we use. Um, there's technology now in chemistry. There's new astronomy. They have the, you know, the, the telescopes that are out that are looking at further and deeper into the universe. It's just fascinating. So that, that was what helped me as a kid really grow toward this career field. It's interesting that here comes the next question. Uh, in this hyper-connected era, how you keep your head wrapped around this complex set of technologies? Yeah, I'll tell you, it's difficult to wrap yourself around, you know, all these technologies and, and be fully compre comprehensive. I think there's only really two strategies that one could follow. First, you could either pick a discipline and be an expert in that discipline, like pick one and be very, very disciplined at learning that and, and understanding that and becoming an expert and uh, making yourself indispensable with regard to that technology. Alternatively, the other strategy is become a generalist and know a little bit about all the technologies and how they intertwine and interconnect and be sort of a systems person where you can take the pieces of these different technology elements and you could stitch them together into a complete solution. I, I don't know that there's a, a third strategy out there that I could recommend. I think it's, it, you, you gotta pick one of those two. This is great, Brad. Uh, just one curious question. Uh, so, are there any specific areas in the tech that excites you more than others? And how do they fuel your ambition? Yeah, I think the pieces of technology, first off, artificial intelligence is all the rave right now. I think it's impressive that, you know, there, how much of that is being pursued. I think it's kind of grassroots to some degree. I think a lot of people are finding ways to make their own personal job or work life easier. I know I've used it for, you know, resume creating. I've used it for, you know, just weird answers that I want to ask the internet. Uh, so artificial intelligence is, is definitely a big rave these days. And I think it's going to help in a lot of fronts, but I think it's going to be grassroots where people are going to individualize it. And then over time, businesses will will figure out from those experiments what is best to do at, at a business level. Uh, but there's so many different aspects of it. I think uh, unmanned vehicles is another mm -hmm. interesting pursuit right now going on in technology. You see it a lot in aerial drones, but now you're seeing watercraft, surface watercraft that are drones. Uh, obviously, self-driving cars are a big pursuit so that people can free up their time. Much of this of those two pieces right are really focused on freeing up individual time so that we can use our brains for more creative things to create new technology or to create new ways of living or new ways of working such that you know life becomes that much less arduous than it has been over the years so brad as you mentioned about ai which is a new magic potion spreading across the globe but what do you think? Is it taking away our creativity or it, it, is it working in a different way? No, I think AI, I think AI, although you see AI today, especially like on Bing Creator, where it can be, it can do artistic work. I think AI has those capabilities, but I think the way that most people will employ it is to really take care of some of the routine things in their life so that they can, themselves can be creators. I think that we as human beings have this draw toward being creative. We wanna, whether it's art or music or technology or just anything and everything, architecture, right? We, we, we thrive on being creative. And so anything that we can do to move the mundane, the, the, the easy, the, the routine tasks to something more systemized and free up our mental capacity for more creativity, that is where it's going. And like I said, self-driving cars, they would love for someone to be sitting in a car, let the car drive them to work, and they can be using that time to read or create or draw or take care of other work, uh, be, be the deciders uh, for things that are going on in their job. Absolutely true, Brad. I agree with you. So moving ahead, here's the next question. Given your extensive experience in uh, driving innovation and transformation 
what are your technology predictions for the next two years, uh, particularly for business transformation? Yeah, so business transformation, I think, is is something I was touching on just a moment ago in that, you know, artificial intelligence, it's a big raid these days. It's grassroots. And I think for the next few years, it's going to be individualized. But from a business transformation standpoint, I think the businesses are going to look at this, these little experiments that people are doing individually and determine how can I take the best of these experiments that individuals are doing with AI and use that for the benefit of the business. So, for example, if I free up individuals, will I improve certain metrics in the business? Can I increase our revenue? Can I decrease our cycle time? Can I increase our responsiveness to change? So I think from a business transformation standpoint, that is a challenge because I think these experiments are going to be individual, but I think it also presents a wealth of content that a business can take from and say, I like these experiments that these individuals were doing. Let's make that more mainstream in our business. Yes, Brad. Uh, and how will these uh, advancements impact revenue growth in areas like customer-centric solutions and operational excellence? Well, so for example, on a revenue side, um, a lot of times you'll see it even today where you might contact support at a company and you're literally dealing with a chatbot. And sometimes it's frustrating, right? Sometimes it's like, well, do I really want to deal with a chatbot? But if you can take some of the routine stuff um, like that, where individuals can get their help and they don't need to engage with an individual, like a human being, that works, right? That you could actually then expand your sales force to go after and pursue other opportunities and be more aggressive with sales. So a way of growing revenue, for example, is the routine stuff, turn it into some form of artificial intelligence. And in the uh, in the creative stuff, like how do you sell to a particular market or to a particular segment or a particular demographic? That's where you want to apply your human creativity. Yes, Brad. So here comes the next question. So building team is an art. So how do you manage to build your team uh, that aligns with your mission? Yeah. So. One of my favorite books that I've ever read is called Now Discover Your Strengths. It's written by a gentleman named Marcus Buckingham. And in that, in that book, he states a wonderful quote that says, you don't need well-rounded individuals. What you need is well-rounded teams. So when you talk about the art of building teams, I, I, I like this idea that you don't need like one person to have all the skills, but if you have all the skills across a team of people, they will become self-reliant, they will become you know, sort of working together collaboratively. So for example, if you and I were working on a team, I know that you're stronger with communications, but I'm stronger with maybe, you know, uh, strategic thinking. Together, I might devise what we should communicate, but your skill is, here's how we're gonna package that into a better piece of communication. So that's a wonderful way of, of building teams is, is looking at individuals' strengths and assembling a team that has all the strengths that you need. and. So regarding alignment to the mission in this regard, there's a simple concept of nesting, which is that, you know, my team is working on these particular initiatives or these particular projects, and they support the mission above us in this way. Uh, for example, you know, the um, that if I deliver this particular initiative or this project, I will get this result. And this result ties to this mission above us. So that's another way of, of, of building teams as well is do I have all the right skill sets and do I have the right pursuits in order to further the mission of the entire organization? Yes, Brad. So uh, you said it right. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that NSYS also excels in this approach uh, by meticulously aligning team strengths with organizational goals. Uh, yeah. So uh, the next question for you is, uh, what are your thoughts on work-life balance and how do you personally strike that balance? For me, the question is not so much about time management, but priority management. So I, I like to start my week out with a clear priorities that are both, here's my business priorities and here's my personal or my life priorities. And I'll, I'll interweave them. So I'll have a top priority that I need to get done this week or this day for my business. And I'll also have one for my family. Like I need to get this done for the family. So interweaving those priorities. So I would recommend to people 
don't focus so much on time management, focus more on priority management. Have your clear priorities, at least your top three in each category. What are your top three business priorities? What are your top three life priorities? Know what those are. And ideally you wrote them in such a way that they're small enough that you can get them done in one to three days, right? You don't want to write something that's huge and complex like, I want to build a new home. Well, you're not going to get that done in one week, but maybe what your ta your priority is in, in building a new home might be, I want to hire an architect. This week, I want to find an architect. You can get that done in a week. So make that one of your priorities that you want to do for your life so that it's in the top three and you can get it done. Business-wise, same thing. Don't take on these massive, large priorities that are going to take weeks and weeks to accomplish. Break your priorities down into something you get done in one to three days, and that should start your week out. And you'll find that as you're knocking out your priorities, everything else starts to take care of itself. So I would advise don't, don't focus on time management, focus on priorities. Brad, how do you see uh, disruptive technologies influenced by geopolitical affairs or dynamics? Yeah, as I mentioned, drones and other unmanned vehicles, they're, they're a good example of this. Now, their need arose from geopolitical friction. I mean, at first, it was aerial unmanned vehicles, and that was brought about because of geopolitical friction. Militaries needed to have this technology. They didn't want to risk life, but they still wanted to be able to uh, enforce their or force their will upon another country that they may be in conflict with. So you're seeing those aerial vehicles now. We're seeing watercraft vehicles for navies that are being uh, created. So another example is, is navigation software. We have on our smartphones today, the ability to use a mapping software and know how to drive from one location to another location, the best route. And we have this navigation software that actually arose again out of a geopolitical affair because there was a need to navigate military vehicles on a battlefield and to know precisely where they're located so that when you were shooting weapons, you didn't hit your own friendly people. So these pieces of technology that you find that uh, that are, you say, influenced by geopolitical affairs, I think that there's a plethora of examples where militaries have invented stuff and we now as civilians are enjoying the benefit of it. And those were just a few examples. So Brad, can you provide an example of a strategic decision you made that was influenced by this combination of uh, technology disruption and geopolitical considerations? Uh, I don't know that I have a specific example that is, that's business-wise. I do have one when I was in the military for seven years. So there was a um, when, when i was in the military i was in a branch called field artillery and field artillery is all about delivering you know indirect weapon systems upon the enemy at that time i was responsible for a radar unit and a radar unit is literally there to detect when the enemy is firing artillery or mortars to pinpoint where they are and to direct fires against them and we had an assignment of how do you connect this radar to a helicopter so that the helicopter could literally go and deliver fire upon the enemy who was shooting mortars at you. And those two pieces of equipment were digital, but they never talked to each other. And we were told time and time again, you're not gonna get them to talk to each other. It's, they're not the same software. But me and my team, we were persistent. We kept at it. We tried different techniques and we found a technique in which we could connect a radar directly to a helicopter. What that did in terms of a strategic benefit was it shrunk the cycle time between when we found out an enemy was firing at us with say mortars, for example, and how quickly we could get a helicopter on the scene to find that enemy and stop them. And that was an amazing amount of benefit that we provided to the United States Army. I mean, we basically increased the lethality of the United States Army with this one piece of technology that we, that people told us we couldn't do, but we found a way to do it. And and that's one of my proudest accomplishments actually in the military was was taking on that that challenge and actually finding a solution for it. So that's just one example. So Brad, we are at the end of our conversation and this is the final question for you. So as per you, what should be the lasting impact of technology on human and the world? 
In my opinion, our, our default state of being, like the way that we as human beings want to live is we want to be free and, and we want to pursue joy. We want to, we want to find those things that bring us joy. So I think the lasting impact of technology on humanity should be maximizing our free time. So when we talk a moment about work-life balance, how much more fun would it be if we had more life and less work and we use technology to do that? So, you know, I talked a moment ago that all of us like being creative in our own way and in the business world, you know, we could use that extra free time for creative benefits for our employees. In other words, maybe we create things for that the that the company will benefit from, or we could use that extra free time to index more towards our family. So I think anything that we can do that will free up our own time to use in a in a fashion that is going to be beneficial either for our family or for our, our, our employer, those are really a great lasting impact that technology can have. I think another way that technology can be helpful and have lasting impact is environmental things. I, we've done things over the years that we were unconscious of. We didn't realize that, you know, plastic might be a bad thing to put in the environment, for example, or a pl a plastic may be a bad thing to throw in the in the ocean, for example. So anything that we can use technology to to increase uh, our our ability to keep our environment clean is a good thing. I know there's a lo lot more recycling going on and maybe we could create technology where there's self-driving garbage trucks that will pick up, you know, your container of recycling and then you're not paying for an operator to, to, to do that. Maybe it's an electric vehicle so you're not burning gas. I think technology that could help us in our effort to keep our environment clean or to clean up after ourselves would be another cool thing to leave behind. So that was a great one, Brad. And that was my last question for you. So uh, we will be wrapping up our this episode of Luminary Lounge. And uh, just wanted to say a few things like uh, your experience in military and the tech world made our Luminary Lounge session truly exceptional. Uh, so thank you for your time and have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you for staying up late at night to, to do this time with me. I appreciate it.